I'm Rashad Ritchie and welcome to the conversation. We have a really interesting guest on the show today. I did some reading up on this guy and I gotta tell you, I am still confused by where he stands on some issues, but we're gonna get right into it. Ladies and gentlemen, we have Scott Yenner, author of The Recovery of Family Life, Exposing the Limits of Modern Ideologies. Also political science professor at Boise State University. So let's talk to Scott. Scott, welcome, how are you? Hi, thanks for having me on, I appreciate it. Thank you for being here, man. So let's get right into it because you have a lot to say about the traditional family or the modern family. You also have a lot to say about transgenderism and feminism. Let me just get right into this question. Do you think that the transgender movement is actually adversarial or impacting traditional families or traditional marriages? Yeah, I mean, I do. And the reason for that is that it seems to me that traditional marriage is gonna depend on there being a man and a woman. And, uh, and those categories kind of corresponding to some broadly accepted social roles and expectations. And uh, all the movements uh, in the modern uh, regime that kind of upset those roles and expectations end up having a corrosive effect on the amount of family formation, uh, the commitment that people end up having to family life and marriage, and uh, the number of children that they have. And so I think, not only transgenderism, but uh, the sexual liberation movement and uh, feminism itself uh, have and are intended to have a kind of upsetting effect on the uh, on traditional family life. Now, Professor, uh, you and I both mm-hmm. are social scientists, so we believe in data, we believe in research. Let me ask you, do you have any research to show how many marriages um, have been split up by transgenders? No, um, although I think that would be a very difficult uh, um, project to try to execute. I think we do see that over the last 60 years, uh, the movement out of which transgenderism itself grows, uh, the sexual liberation movement and feminism have corresponded with declines in marriage rates, declines in marital stability, declines in birth rates. Um, Now, I don't think it's a monocausal thing. I think there are other things that contribute to the decline of those elements. But it's very difficult to isolate one of those. Professor, in all due respect, Scott, you have isolated it. I agree with you 100%. These issues are not monolithic. They cannot exist Mm -hmm. in their own silo, which means they're always contributing factors in your variables. But you decided to isolate transgenderism. And then you said you can't really isolate it because then it's difficult to make a conclusion, but let me read some statistics about where decline of marriage, where the increase of divorce actually comes from. This is based on research. Um, The number one reason for divorce, according to research, is lack of commitment. Number two, depending on the research study, uh, is finances. Number three, arguments. Number four, infidelity. Number five, um, marrying too young. Number six, unrealistic ex- expectations. I don't hear feminism nor transgenderism listed in any of that um, whatsoever. And this is based on individuals who have actually said, here's why I'm not married and here's why I got divorced. And here's why you have this massive decline of individuals who are married. And, and before you answer that, let, let me go back to the 1700s and beyond. Uh, when marriage ratios were very high in America. You can't point to a high marriage ratio and say we had a remarkable society because women had to stay in marriages because it was basically illegal to sign a divorce contract if you were a woman. And it was illegal for you to own property if you were a woman. So that means the way the societal construct was configured, a woman had to remain married based on the system and the laws. It was not an indication of the morality of the country. What say you? All right, well, there's several things in there. Um, So first of all, now I believe, and I think actual data supports this quite easily, that feminism and sexual liberation theories affect people's idea of what commitment is, how long commitments should be had, what people will argue over. Um, And so so even even those those studies that you cite really presume 
what commitment is and uh, and and the direction in which uh, that will end up shaping people's expectations. I think feminism has shaped the expectations of women and changed them in marriage. I think sexual liberation theories have changed men's expectations in marriage, and therefore they shape the way that both men and women are committed to marriage. So I don't think the statistics that you cite on divorce really point in any kind of direction like that. The the, the second complex of issues that you bring up concerns kind of where the baseline should be. And you know, I'm not even saying that the baseline should be 1720 or anything like that. I think that American uh, uh, the 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 prescription on uh, women owning property really faded away by 1850 and 60 in almost every American state. Divorce was legal in all states but one at the time of the American founding. It was more difficult to get, but it was legal. It became. But you do easy. admit that had that had a complete influence sure. yeah, on the fact has. that women the, did not the get laws, the laws. The laws shape people's ideas, mm-hmm. expectations. Um, I believe that in the 1820s, and I believe that in 2020. And uh, and I'm trying to be consistent with that to try to show what ideologies inform our laws end up leading to different kinds of practice. Okay, let's talk about feminism and. Um, you know, two guys talking about feminism. I right, go figure. It's okay. Right? But let's it's let's okay. talk about feminism because uh, you do talk about it a lot in your articles, in your research, in your uh, in your book. Uh, feminism, uh, to my understanding, and you tell me if you have a different definition of feminism, but feminism um, is basically a movement. It was a campaign or multiple campaigns that sought to make sure that women had reproductive rights, that women had access to health care, that women had laws to protect them if they were in a domestic violence situation or a relationship where that was a reality. That women fought for these particular rights and these rights were codified in our American society. Do you agree that the feminism movement or the feminist movement helped usher in and become a catalyst for those rights I just described? Yeah, I think those are kind of how feminism works itself out in practice over time. I make a distinction between what I call retail feminism, which is how it works itself out in particular policies at particular times, and the overarching goals of feminism, which are articulated, I think, very nicely by early feminist thinkers, including Simone de Beauvoir. Kate Millett, I think, has the most precise articulation of what it stands for. She says that feminism aims at the end of what she calls patriarchal socialization. The achievement of second, the achievement of economic and emotional independence of women from the family. And third, the erasing of all sexual taboos. So I think all of the elements that you just pointed to, Dr. Ritchie, really point to those pillars and goals of feminism. Their part. But feminism hasn't closed up shop because it has achieved many of those goals. Well, they, because, they shouldn't close up yeah. shop. You, you would no, agree that feminism definitely has its place, right? I, I believe that feminism has initiated a, a rolling revolution in American life. And you're right, it won't close up shop. Is it a good revolution in your opinion or a bad one? It has good parts and bad parts. But is that not true with almost every revolution where you yes, have a spectrum yes. of individuals involved yeah. uh, I, who are yeah. uh, promoters of the revolution, right? Well, no, I mean, I mean something different and deeper by it having good Tell parts me. and bad parts. Uh, what I mean by it is that uh, feminism has moved the needle. It has achieved greater independence for women, greater autonomy, greater uh, reproductive freedom, as you mentioned, uh, more independence from the family. Um, but it has social costs. And those social costs are fewer children, worse marriages, fewer marriages, marriages break up more. And but once again, parts, yeah. So that's what I, mean by I have saying, to interrupt. That's what I mean by saying it has good things and bad things. I got you, but you, think, but you threw you in. You think feminism has costs? T- tell me what study, what research, what can you point to that says feminism as a political movement, because that is the working definition of feminism. It is a political movement to make sure women have particular rights as you just described. What study can you cite to show that feminism has stopped marriages? That feminism is a contributing element to create a culture 
that less honors marriage and has fewer children. That less honors marriage? That marriage that honors marriage less. Yeah. What's your definition of traditional marriage, Professor? Uh, one man, one woman, one time. Where did you get that from? I don't know. I'm just kind of sitting here. It was me. Can I can I say that? What? Can I say one man, one woman, one time and have that? You be just my answer. <laughs> well, you just said it. But where yeah. where did you get that traditional marriage was between one man, one woman? Where did you get that from? Who taught you that? Well, it's in the laws of the Western world from basically 2000 until 2012. Now, is that traditional in the context of global uh, traditionalism? Because I can point to ancient civilizations, I can point to uh, more traditional um, uh, countries uh, that have had the practice of marriage for much longer. And I can also point to the Bible uh, where marriage was not defined. Uh, between a man, one man and one woman. Traditional marriage was very different for their tradition. My point to you is when mm -hmm. we say the terminology traditional marriage, that terminology only counts if you're saying all of the other traditional marriage or marriages or the methodology of marriage in other nations or in biblical times or even just across the ocean, that's not traditional. What you're really saying is marriage how we do in America. It's not traditional because marriage, there are other marriages marriage, more traditional, other ways more traditional, right? Marriage, how we do it in the Roman, Greco Roman, and Christian world. Yeah, the Western world is, I think, yeah. how I defined it. And I, I agree with what you say. I mean, I think there are various models within which marriage uh, can be embedded. Um, for instance, uh, the barbarians that conquered Rome were very tribal, um, they didn't really have a public. It was basically a family way of organizing political society. Very extended, um, big distinction between those who are in the family and outside of the family. Those mm -hmm. have existed in parts of the modern world. Well, uh, I mean, we also you have, yeah, yeah. You we are have polygamous families. I assume. We have polygamous families as well, right? Yeah. And it's not clear, you know, it's not clear that uh, Christianity uh, condemns polygamous marriage. Well, and, well do you? Uh, well, I think all of these questions are kind of situational. Um, in in our particular place and time, uh, I think polygamy uh, would be a bad move for our society at this time. Uh, but I can imagine that there would be certain circumstances. For instance, in ancient Athens, after they suffered an extreme plague, where they encouraged polygamy because there were so few men and there was a need to repopulate the area. So I do think you know I'm flexible on these matters. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I'm you know I think social health is an important part of a marriage policy. Let me ask you about the uh, question referencing children. Do you believe children are happier in marriages than if they're being raised by a single parent? I think that I mean many studies show. I think the best one is by uh, David Blake and Horn in the late '90s. Uh, shows that parent the children thrive more. Uh, when they live with their biological parents in an intact family, they uh, learn more. Right. They commit. They commit fewer crimes. They uh, they graduate from high school. They're more likely to go to college. They're more likely to accumulate uh, capital uh, over the course of their lives. All of I mean other indications too, but those are among them. Let me highlight a study published by the uh, by Penn State, uh, and they published published this in 2019. Uh, it says that they found the children are no less happy. Let me say that again, no less happy in single parent homes than in homes with a mother and a father. They also found in this study that is published that it is the quality of the relationship rather than the quantity of the relationship. The study took a sample size of 12,877 children from age seven um, and up three types of homes, biological mother and father, biological parent, step parent, and also a single parent home. Uh, and they followed this study. The study showed that the quality of the parents, regardless of single or two parent households, had more of a bearing on the child's development, happiness, and ultimate success than the simple number of parents in the household. What do you say to that study that was published? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think I can agree with that study. The question would be uh, whether or not marriage makes for better parenting. 
And does it? Uh, if Mary, I mean, really, think about that. Couples, does marriage yeah, make yeah. for better parenting? People who are, people who are committed and into the long, uh, in it for the long term are more likely to see the things that they do in common to be things that they project forward in time. So, so you ever seen two people I can, committed? I can agree. Yeah. What's that? You ever, you ever seen two people committed to be together and they're miserable? Yeah. They can't stand each other, but they're yeah. going to stay and together. I've seen, and I've seen uh, people who cohabitate do a great job. Yeah. Um, you know, when, when you talk about per capita data, um, the, the question is, does marriage form better parents? And uh, does is that related to uh, kids thriving more? And I think uh, I, I see nothing inconsistent with the Penn State study and the loads of studies that have been really published um, over the last 50 years on this family question. Uh, talking about how marriage uh, ends up producing both more children and, and more uh, thriving children. Scott, I'm with you on some things. Um, I think uh, in an ideal situation, you do have both parents in the household. Uh, but in a more ideal situation, you have uh, loving parents uh, in the household. And, and one of the things studies like this simply neglect, uh, because it's very hard to quantify in a research matrix, is how much love is shown in this household, regardless of if it's a two parent household, one parent household, etc. Um, I was a foster kid, okay? Uh, and I went through multiple adoption uh, situations, adoption agencies, adopted parents. Uh, and I could feel the love and then I could also feel uh, the tearing away of that love at times. But what I hold today in the relationships that I hold today, uh, they are of individuals, moms and dads, plural, who took time out of their lives to foster me, right? So they gave me love and I had some really high quality parental relationships because of that. And, and Scott, I turned out pretty good, mm -hmm. but I'm not using the microcosm of, of my life to explain the, micro, the macrocosm of data. The data is also clear, as you just agreed, it's not just the family unit, and, and here's the beef I have with, uh, with guys like you in this arena. We will say things like, or you will say things like, marriages basically equate to better outcomes for children. When there's contrary data that says, no, you have to take into account the quality of the relationship of the parent before you can even uh, magnify the reason the child is happier. So why is it that we say these things, uh, these conclusions about data and we fail to acknowledge the reality that many single parent households also produce uh, wonderful children, very successful children and children that are able to love and, and, and be great and productive? Yeah, I don't think anyone denies that uh, and I don't deny it. I mean, this is the question of odds. Yeah. Uh, if, you're, if, you're a ki if you're a kid born uh, to an intact family, who the parents are committed to one another, and uh, you know your chances of turning out, gra graduating from high school and thriving in your life, are you know about sixty-five percent. Um, if you're not from that particular uh, uh, milieu, it's lower, um, and it it kind of differs based on the milieu how much lower, and um, so so I mean I. It's difficult to take a single case and say, well, see, this one person thrived. And I agree, people thrive. People can yeah. be happy without marriage. Right. Um, well, actually, can be miserable within it. <laughs> listen, man, it's interesting you say that um, because there's a study that came out not too long ago that showed that the happiest women uh, in America are actually unmarried without children. And that's based on a study that came out in 2020, right? Which, which actually flew in the face of both Harvard and Yale studies that suggested quite the opposite. Well, what's happening now is that you have a different um, an, a different interpretation of happiness. What made a person happy or what we thought happiness was uh, 50 years ago may not be what we think happiness is today. You agree with that? Absolutely, I think feminism has shaped what our ideas of happiness is. Jen, I think you can reconcile those studies. I mean, I don't know the exact details of all those sure. studies, but I've seen many things. Look, I'm a philosophy guy, I study I Plato, I study the theories <laughs> of, of feminism. I do social science kind of uh, to confirm or disconfirm this stuff. Um, but the, I, I, you know, my, my bottom line on this stuff from what, I've, what I can tell the data is that younger women are happier and older women are unhappier, or to me. Younger women under, let's say, 35 are happier when they're single than married. 
And then there's a transition point. It's not exactly clear when it is, but it's somewhere between 35 and 42, where uh, that reverses, and you're and more women are happier when they're married and uh, and have children. So um, I, th- I think there are ways of reconciling all of that stuff. Yeah. Um, all of those studies. Doc, I just think sometimes your focus, your emphasis is in the wrong place. You talk about transgenderism being a threat to marriage when no research study shows that whatsoever. Um, you talk about feminism being a threat to marriage. There's, there's no evidence that feminism has hurt marriage. Uh, there is evidence that shows uh, women who make money, women who are independent uh, and they are connected to a spouse. Um, financially stable, they actually do stay married longer. And the reason why those women are able to make more money and have more, uh, have a more stable economic um, lifestyle is because of the efforts and the successes of feminism. But before I let you go, uh, I can't miss uh, the opportunity to say something about how does uh, the the toxic the toxic um, masculinity issue play into all of this? Or does it at all in your opinion? Well, I mean, I, I don't think uh, masculinity is uh, is always toxic. It's not always uh, toxic. I'm it, only it, talking it, about the toxic kind, brother. Yeah, I mean, civilization tries to tame it. And uh, one of the institutions that civilization has always used to tame masculinity is marriage. Um, men are turned from warriors into providers, mm-hmm. and uh, and uh, as as marriage declines, I, I think mar- uh, men do worse. Uh, sometimes they're not connected to anything, and sometimes they're connected to violence in ways that they wouldn't otherwise be. Man, um, listen, Doc, yeah. I wish I had more time, man. It's actually been a very fun discussion. Um, I invite you back anytime, brother. I appreciate the time today on the conversation. Well, thanks for having me. Thanks for watching The Young Turks, really appreciate it. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. You'll get to interact with us more. There's live chat emojis, badges. You've got emojis of me, Anna, John, JR, so those are super fun. But you also get playback of our exclusive member only shows and specials right after they air. So all that, all you gotta do is click that join button right underneath the video. Thank you.